Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Healthcare's Missing Link. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Sherwood, as always, and it's my pleasure and honor today to welcome a distinguished colleague, new friend, one I've admired, and one that's given me the most um, challenging course that I've ever went through in my entire life, Dr. Christine Houghton. We are speaking, and you are in Queensland, Australia. And we are, I believe, 13 hours ahead or, or behind you or something like that, right? Uh, I don't know. It's Friday morning here, so that's all I can tell you. Nine o'clock Friday morning. A long ways away. Now, you have an extensive background. You hold a PhD in nutrigenomics, um, a BS in biochemistry from the University of Queensland. I know you are a registered nutritionist as well and an adjunct lecturer. Um, you're after practicing uh, nutritional medicine for three decades, that's a long time, you're now focusing uh, all of your extensive clinical background on training other people, research and development of, of credible compounds, which we'll talk about. And in addition to her scientific and lay publications, uh, she has auth authored Switched On, Harnessing the Power of Nutrigenomics to Optimize Health as a co-author of two courses in nutrigenomics for practicing clinicians. And I will say that um, my wife, Dr. Michelle, and I are uh, proudly survivors of those courses because <laughs> they, they were really, uh, wow, many days, um, Christine, we spent at the Starbucks every weekend listening to you and Yale go through this stuff and I, my mind was blown every day. So, um, Hey, let's dive into this, shall we? Love to. So, Thank you know, a lot of times, for having me. yeah, this is going to be awesome. A lot of times we talk about this, um, this idea of nerf two and how that's important to, to activate for our, our cellular defenses. I mean, what is that? And how, how does that work? Well, where do we begin? Let's start in 1992 because the concept of NRF2 was just discovered. So prior to that, for so many decades, we talked about antioxidants as if all cells needed as much antioxidant activity as possible. And in 1992, when a group at Johns Hopkins University were investigating NRF2 and discovered the power of broccoli sprouts, this whole concept of nutrigenomics was born. Now, that said, the nutrigenomics term wasn't even coined until 2004. The very year that I left clinical practice, I discovered this concept of nutrigenomics and really that event has changed the course of my career hereafter. So in answer to your question more directly, let me just share my uh, screen for a moment. And I will show you, my screen doesn't want to share, Mark. Should have it now. Yeah. Okay. There we are. Um, so. There we are right. now. There yeah. we are. We're right. So what this idea, what this NRF2 is, I liken it to a switch on the wall. When you turn on a switch, pretty powerful things happen. So what's on the left-hand side here is a whole lot of foods. Our list of foods here could be many-fold greater than that. But there are chemicals we call phytochemicals in each one of those plant foods which actually send signals to our cells when we eat them and those signals activate this NRF2 switch it then sends other signals to our DNA and what that does now is to switch on hundreds of protective genes which all act like a, a bank of genes all acting together. Mm -hmm. So where we used to think cells needed antioxidants to do these wonderfully protective things, we now know that that's not how it works. It's these genes which are switched on by food, turning on the NRF2 switch, that gives cells their remarkable protection. So it's completely changed the way we think about nutrition. Where the DNA connection comes in in practices like this, so there's a human cell, let's say, there's some DNA over here. So if you're going to eat um, a health-promoting diet, 
those molecules in that food eventually break down, they're digested and end up talking to our DNA. That alters gene expression. And what that does now is to switch on our own production of our own antioxidant enzymes, which are literally millions of times more potent than any vitamin C or E or any other uh, antioxidant that we're used to taking as a supplement, which is on our energy production, our detoxification mechanism. So this was a huge revelation when we realised how cells work. But the corollary to this is the fact that if we eat junk food, that food is also sending different sorts of signals to our cell and to our DNA, and those signals now promote inflammation, oxidation and chronic disease. And really, in a nutshell, that's what nutrigenomics is. It's food molecules talking to our genes. So this is where we're talking about a big time, where it's food is medicine, right? I mean, this goes back to Hippocrates' original statement. And uh, where did we go wrong, Christine? Because this is not talked about as a baseline and fundamental foundational uh, place in in clinical work today as as a general rule. It's not, except for those of us who work on the fringe, if you like. Uh, But you will notice it in the last year. So all this focus on protection and prevention against Mm COVID-19. Have you heard one word of health or nutrition message coming out of any of the public health authorities? Because I haven't. Not a single word. We're masking, we're distancing, we're washing our hands not a word about the power of food. And really, human bodies are made out of the food they eat. That's very interesting because today, just today, prior to our our coming on, I I wrote an article and the title was Dead Silence. And and the context (laughs) was, why is the government and our leaders dead silent on this issue. So, you know, you hit the nail on the head with that. We've got to get back to this. And 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 we are, you and I are, and the rest of our <laughs> uh, fringe people are. But, uh, you know, you, you bring up this this whole concept of science and you've shown us here how it affects, you know, this uh, this nuclear action leading to messenger RNA. That's just fascinating stuff. And it's happening in every cell of the body and it always did. So, Um, Let me just show you where historically this um, research comes from. If we just move on a little bit here. So Mm -hmm. the sulforaphane story uh, began in Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore back in the early 90s. And Professor Paul Talalay, who died just last year, a remarkable man who was the one who discovered that these broccoli sprouts, these tiny little plants, had such extraordinary ability to activate cell defences. And here was his first paper on the subject, a major inducer of anti-carcinogenic protective enzymes um, from broccoli. And as it turned out later, it was the broccoli sprout that really held all the power, not so much Um, the vegetable, but we can have a look at that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um, And from that, just an an enormous amount of research. Initially, they were working on protection against cancer, which we call chemo prevention, and um, discovered that although we know that plant foods in general are protective against diseases like cancer, Mm -hmm. um, and the cruciferous vegetables, of which broccoli is a member, are the best uh, researched in terms of their ability. And then we went to the next stage where we started to look at particular mechanisms. So in the cell, there's this detoxification pathway that we call phase two detoxification. And there's a, the final enzyme in that chain is one called quinone reductase. It doesn't matter about the name. But quinone reductase stands just as a sentinel just before DNA and protects DNA from um, mutagenesis. So Mm -hmm. if you want to be sure you don't corrupt your DNA, it's quinone reductase that does the work. So we need um, high-functioning phase 2 detoxification enzymes for that to work, and that was one of the first things that the Talalay group discovered 
Um, and in terms of finding out why it's chemo-preventive, well, largely because it's a very powerful inducer of this quinone reductase. Then they went on to say that sprouts of many broccoli cultivars contain negligible quantities of indoles, uh, which predominate in the mature broccoli vegetable and may give rise to products like indole-3-carbonyl, which mm. is used commonly as a supplement, mm. but Talalé show that in some instances it's actually enhancing tumorigenesis. So, again, he looked at the fact that if you're looking at the sprouts and you're looking at the sulforaphane, very small quantities of sprouts are so potent in their cancer-protective effects that they're much more beneficial than looking at the mature vegetable in the same way. So why does that happen? Well, first of all, um, broccoli sprouts are between 20 to 100 or 20 to 50 times more concentrated in this ability than the vegetable. But it works like this. So there's actually no sulforaphane in the broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm. What is in the sprouts is this inactive precursor called glucoraphanin an enzyme called morosinase, and when you bite or chew the plant, the morosinase enzyme now acts on the glucoraphanin precursor that produces the sulforaphane, which is the bioactive compound. Problem is sulforaphane is quite unstable, so there's no such thing as a product that contains sulforaphane. Uh, even though there are products on the market that say mm -hmm. they contain sulforaphane, if you see that on the label, you know that that's nonsense um, and the manufacturer doesn't know what he's talking about mm -hmm. unless there's some particular technology that has stabilised that sulforaphane. So we're talking about 100% whole foods, nothing added, nothing but water removed. Mm -hmm. So therefore... If you have a whole sprout and you kill the morosinase enzyme, you don't get any sulforaphane. And unfortunately, now, many of sorry, how is, how is the how would one kill the morosinase enzyme in the you heat it, it. you it just heat, it. Okay. heat it. And wow. the vast majority of broccoli sprout supplements in the US are actually not broccoli sprout supplements. They're broccoli seed extracts. Now, that sounds like that's not much difference. It's extremely different. So what the manufacturers of those products do is they take the seeds and they uh, kill the morosinase enzyme and they're really extracting now this glucoraphanin because that's mm. what you're buying. And for a long time, <clears throat> they call this um, sulforaphane glucosinolate. They simply made up a name, which is a, sounds like it's a science chemical term. It's not. It's a marketing term. Um, and, in fact, those products don't produce any sulforaphane. Mm. The other thing to note is when you cook the vegetables, they've got no enzyme um, because it's an enzyme. It's heat mm -hmm. sensitive. And once you get it over about 60 or 70 degrees, it's dead. So you can't cook your vegetables very easily in that way. And I'll show you in a minute um, how much you can cook it in order to protect it. But the thing here is it's these extracts which have no morosinase activity. So mm. if you're looking to buy something, you do not buy something that is a broccoli seed extract because you've got mm. no enzyme. So just a bit of a summary of the advantages of the broccoli sprout versus the vegetable. So there's the seeds. The seeds are very high in the glucoraphanin. The sprouts mm -hmm. are only a few days old, so they're also very high. Mm -hmm. By the time the sprout grows out to a mature vegetable, you've virtually diluted. The glucoraphanin that was in these little seeds now has been diluted as it appears in the vegetable. So that's the reason that the sprouts are so much higher than the vegetable. Now, that's not a message to say don't eat broccoli vegetable. Do eat it uh, because yeah. what you get in the vegetable that you don't get in the sprout is you get folate, you get vitamin mm. K1, you get a range of B vitamins, you've got other phytochemicals. When we produce broccoli sprout products, we're producing them specifically because we want that bioactive sulforaphane mm -hmm. because we know it's switching on NRF2 and that's what's protective. 
if we're eating the vegetable, <clears throat> we're eating for different reasons. We know we won't get much sulforaphane out of that, but that's okay because we have a, a vast array of other essential nutrients mm -hmm. that are coming out of that. And just for a comparison, just to remember, a small amount of sprouts, you'd have to eat that much broccoli vegetable roughly to uh, have the equivalent of what's in those sprouts. So what thoughts does that trigger in your mind, Mark? Well, I'm th thinking, you know, uh, a couple of things. Number one, I think it's very good information for all of our listeners to have on how to select things. <laughs> And uh, certainly, you know, if you can, uh, at some point, um, you know, you can be specific with a product here. That would be very cool. I'd love that because we want to mm -hmm. point people in the right direction. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is, it, it, you may get to this thought a little later on, but, you know, we take this uh, very concentrated broccoli sprout powder that has the sulforaphane yield to it, upregulation of NERF2, uh, which is good. That's kind of your, your nuclear defense, I call it. But at that mm -hmm. point, can you, is, is there such a thing as being too perpetually upregulated at NERF2 or does it kind of balance itself out? Well, the thing about the NRF2 process is in cells, Mother Nature clear, carefully has a, a system of checks and balances in place. So if we're working in a way that we're supporting Mother Nature, not fighting against her, and I'm, when I say supporting, we are just providing food in as natural form as possible, nothing's mm -hmm. added, nothing but water's removed. We are just having a food and Mother Nature knows perfectly well how to deal with foods and how to ensure that the checks and balances maintain levels as they mm -hmm. should do. Um, because when you when you hit the NRF2 switch, it's not like you've jammed your foot on the accelerator and it stays there. Mm -hmm. um, this constantly, a little bit like a race car driver, is tipping his foot on the brake and the accelerator is yeah. down and tip, 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 and, and this moment-to-moment -moment modulation that occurs in cells. That's quite different from taking something like a handful of synthetic vitamin C tablets and yeah. jamming that into human cells. Mother Nature has never seen that. That that doesn't occur anywhere in nature. There's nowhere in nature you can take a thousand milligram dose of an isolated synthetic synthetic molecule like ascorbate. So I try to look at at models that are mimicking what nature does because I know those internal modulately modular modulating processes are in place to correct what's happening. That's, um, it, that's interesting because, you know, I, you know, I know that, um, you know, in, in my world where um, ac activity, exercise and all that, there was a lot of uh, push for antioxidants and you'll probably get to this, but I know there's studies out there that say that doesn't help at all. It actually can hurt you uh, over time. And so this is something I'm guessing that that every person on planet Earth should be doing, right? Well, they should. And if if you never had access to broccoli at all, which lots of people in the world probably don't, right. how would they activate their NRF2? Well, if they're eating a whole um, well-balanced diet, whole food, unrefined, Lots and lots of plant foods. We say 600 grams of, of fresh, um, non-starchy plants a day is the ideal benchmark, and I'm saying that because there is a study to support that quantity. If you're doing that, um, you're getting fresh air and sunshine and even modest exercise, they're all the things which are upregulating NRF2 naturally. So even if you never heard of broccoli, that's how Mother Nature does it. Mm. What we're doing by using a broccoli sprout supplement um, and the Enduracell supplement, which we developed in our company Cell Logic, is we've developed a supplement which provides a dose that matches the doses that uh, have been used in successful clinical trials. Mm -hmm. so we're looking for a medicinal dose. Um, we're not necessarily telling anybody or we're not telling anybody not to eat a whole food diet and do exercise and all those good things. The reality is we know most people don't. 
Right. And in Australia, one of the um, most recent dietary surveys showed that 96% of Australian adults do not eat the required serves of fruits wow. and vegetables a day. Mm. And that's including all the vegetarians. So right. it's absolutely appalling and we could control so much of the disease in our country and yep. yours and the planet yep. if we were to simply persuade people the value of food. Now, sadly, as we've already seen in the COVID story, there's no incentive whatsoever, not even a mention to look at diet. And yet people are sitting at home um, locked down eating junk food and drinking alcohol in quantities greater than they ever did. And I don't say that critically. I understand perfectly how that happens. But there's not a single word to persuade them that they may be able to improve their chances by changing how they eat and not to mention all the chronic disease. I mean, in Australia, we've had about 800 COVID deaths mm -hmm. um, throughout this year. And I know that's nothing to your 200 odd thousand or so on. But if you consider our 800 deaths for three quarters of a year, last year we had 43,000 cardiovascular deaths. Right. Why? Are, what are we doing about that apart from nothing and um, sending people off for medication and so on and yep. a bit of a pat on the shoulder says better get a bit of that weight off, George, you know. You ought to start walking, maybe eat a bit better. <laughs> what sort of advice is that? It is nothing. Well, here it's, um, it's, it's interesting. Here, I, I believe uh, 600,000 per year cardiovascular deaths. Uh, one, um, someone has a heart attack like every 34 seconds. It's, mm. it's insanity and, and it's, mm. it's becoming something that's a worldwide problem. And, and yet we are, we are doing zero about it. And I would suspect, you know, nobody knows the reason behind it, but we all suspect probably uh, pharmaceutical dry driven education and all that probably has something to do with it. Money, everything's driven by money, but ultimately people are dying. And, and this is something that could really prevent a lot of suffering. And, mm -hmm. and this is something I'm passionate about. So, you know, I, I love this. I love what you're saying. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Well, I mean, I've spent my career, I guess, trying to um, teach patients um, the value of food. And it's so rewarding, as you would know, mm -hmm. when people do trust your advice and follow it and toss the drugs away and realise yeah. they're not dependent on those things, but they are dependent on a healthy lifestyle. And not everybody wants to do that, of course. But mm -hmm. let, me, let me just move on um, a little further. Um, and just say this, so with um, the fact that sulforaphane, one of the most powerful things that it does is it switches on the cell's own, own antioxidant enzymes. And that might sound a little bit peculiar because it's not an antioxidant itself. In fact, it's a weak pro-oxidant. Mm -hmm. And um, sulforaphane is considered to be the most potent of the naturally derived inducers of NRF2. So how can something that's a weak pro-oxidant be beneficial to your health and how can it switch mm. on your antioxidants? I'm going to show you. So it's all about cell defence. So I seldom talk about antioxidants uh, anymore in the way that I once did. I mean, when I was in clinical practice too, I would be encouraging people to have more antioxidants, yeah. not fully understanding what we know now. So if we have a look at it's a little bit like this. So there's a human cell and uh, there's its nucleus and here's its DNA and it's constantly sensing what's going on around it. So we've got a little antenna there. Mm -hmm. And what's going on around the cell? Well, there are all sorts of stressors that are sending signals to the cell all the time. So here it's radiation. It can be air pollution. It can be toxic chemicals from the environment people smoking next to you, motor vehicle exhausts, and even chemicals from the inside. So if our metabolism is not behaving as it should, we can be sending toxic chemicals into our bloodstream and in turn affecting our DNA. So what does that mean to the cell? So the cell registers those stressors, it registers those threats, and it says in its little cellular mind, 
If I don't switch on my defences, all of these stressors are going to create great damage to the cells of my body. So it registers that, and that's what activates in RF2. Mm-hmm. Then it talks to the machinery of the cell in the nucleus and now switches on all of the production of all these protective enzymes. So these could be antioxidant enzymes, detoxification enzymes, enzymes that make glutathione, enzymes that pump out waste materials and so on and so forth. There's 200 or so uh, that we know a fair bit about. So that's actually how human cells defend themselves and that's why a weak stressor in this case happens to be sulforaphane, Mm -hmm. which is weak enough as a pro-oxidant that it doesn't change the redox balance of the cell but strong enough because of its unique molecular structure that it activates this signalling process and off goes the production of defence molecules. Pretty clever, really. Now It's it's amazing. Yeah, I'd say clever. It's amazing. Just amazing. Yeah, and we didn't understand any of that um, until NRF2 was discovered in 1994. So we've had 26 years to get used Mm -hmm. to it, but unfortunately... It takes a long time for the science to translate into the community and unfortunately we've still got the popular narrative of pump more vitamin C into your cells, pump more vitamin A and so on. They they simply don't do what we used to think Mm -hmm. they did and and I see all this COVID strategy telling people to, to take heaps of vitamin C. There's no mechanism we know of by which vitamin C and recognise a danger signal and activate defences. It simply Mm -hmm. cannot do that. But NRF2 can do that Mm -hmm. and some other mechanisms which are associated with uh, the immune system, which perhaps we could talk about another day, um, also do that. But I just want to make it clear that antioxidant vitamins do not do what the cell's own internal defence mechanisms do. Christine, can you Sorry. talk about the can you talk about the difference between the two? Because I know that um, you know antioxidants. I you know I think it's like a one to one ratio. What's the um, um, the difference? Uh, yes. I mean, I want people to really understand that because that's significant. Yes. So <laughs> let's suppose that this little process here, one of the first enzymes that gets switched on uh, in response to a free radical called superoxide is an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. Let's say it's that one. So superoxide dismutase can quench literally millions of free radical species per second. That's millions per second. If you've got a vitamin C molecule and it's bumping up against some radical species in the cell, it quenches one radical species and then it's finished. <laughs> it's become oxidised itself. So that, that's the power of it. And I'd just like to talk about um, exercise again because you referred briefly to exercise before and you mm-hmm. probably remember a study that was in your nutrigenomics course. There was a German mm-hmm. group um, in 2009 that decided they'd find out what would happen if we gave um, young, healthy men in the say, 20s, um, 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day and 400 units of vitamin E. So what they thought they would do is because uh, athletes always want to take antioxidants, old right. and active, um, so they split them into two groups. So one group um, just did this routine exercise program, fairly intensive but fine if you're young and you're 25 and male, Uh, and the other group did exactly the same exercise program but they had the 1,000 milligrams of C and the 400 units of E. They did this over 30 days. What they were measuring were markers of metabolic syndrome. So for people who are on the way to diabetes, we measure these various markers in the blood. At the end of 30 days, they did a reanalysis of all the studies and they were absolutely aghast themselves as researchers to find that the ones on the placebo, just the nothing pill, got all of the predicted benefits that you would get from an exercise program of that kind. The ones on the vitamins got no benefit, absolutely none. 
No Why difference is at that? all. None, none. Yeah. Why is that so? That's because here we've got these weak stressors in the cell that send the signals to activate the defences. We've dumped a whole lot of antioxidant vitamins in here. Now these weak pro-oxidant signals are masked and the cell does not realise it has to upregulate its own defences. Mm. Isn't that remarkable? So the when you dump in the antioxidants, it sort of masks, I think you said, the ability yeah. of your body to recognize the stressor. Therefore, the body can't really upregulate itself at that point like you would Absolutely. It, to. It, it doesn't know it has to do anything. So, um, yes, we've got these weak, so we've got these uh, pro-oxidant signals is what NRF2 is looking for, mm -hmm. and we've mask that signal, we've neutralised it by putting the antioxidant in on top of the pro-oxidant. So we've got, wow. no, we've got no signal. And uh, that completely changes the way mm -hmm. we have to look at what we're doing. There's been a few other studies along those lines, but that was the first of the ones, a researcher called um, Michael Risto in Germany who yeah. did that and he's since published in other areas. But I don't think that message is being heard in the right places. Now, sometimes people say, oh, well, I eat oranges. Is that going to be bad for me? No, it's not at no. all. To get 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, you have to eat about 16 oranges. 16. Four, 16 large <laughs> oranges. Um, to get 400 units of vitamin E, gosh, I've just forgotten the um, conversion now, but I think it's about, is it? three cups of almonds or something like that. I have to go have to and have another look at it. But anyway, the recommended nitrate intake of vitamin E is about 10 units a day and we're mm. giving 400 units. Nowhere in nature is it possible to get 400 mm. units of vitamin E a day. Yes, you could eat 16 oranges, you probably wouldn't. Um, <laughs> but in any case, that's not an isolated synthetic molecule. When you eat an orange, it comes with all of the other package of nutrients in there which can modify the way that a scorbate molecule is mm -hmm. being utilised. There's lots more we have to learn in this area. Um, yeah. We don't know as much as we'd like to know, but it's just fascinating. Um, and I, and to the, a lot of the clinicians that I talk to in Australia and New Zealand in our teaching program, the um, Gut Ecology and Metabolic Modulation Program, once they get a grasp of this concept, it all starts to make a lot of sense then because we're talking, I want to know what's happening in every cell of the body because what I'm doing to influence one cell is influencing virtually all the cells of the body. And so even if I don't have any particular condition that I'm dealing with with a patient, what I'm really doing is I'm improving the efficiency of every cell of the body, mm -hmm. assuming that my patient isn't doing all of the lifestyle things that would be optimum. So we're just improving the efficiency of every cell of the body. So in the public health arena, um, you'll be locked up in prison, I think, if you talk about <laughs> boosting immunity. That's right. one of the taboo topics there. I've said it. Um, and I don't use that term myself either because technically it isn't correct, mm. but I understand that to the non-technical person, talking about boosting immunity has a, has a meaning of some description. So mm. it's a bit of semantics and splitting straws. But ideally, if we are giving ourselves everything they need to function at their peak, the immune cells will come along for the ride as well and we surely must be in a better place if we are looking after the the function of our cells. Yeah, I've looked at it often like this. You know, if you just give the body what it needs, such as just looking at it from the simple fuel, petrol, giving the, the gasoline to the car, it's efficient enough to know how to use it to, yep. to really work it because, you know, frankly, the, the body and its functionality has been here longer than we have, and it knows more than we do. And every time we look at something like this, I am completely floored and in awe of all the things that we know, but moreover, all the things we don't know and all the Absolutely. <laughs> it's fascinating to me. I mean, I want to know more, you know.
Well, which is why I'm glued to reading scientific journals, um, probably far too many hours that are really good for me. But it's, it's fascinating and, and the work is just accelerating at such yeah. a great rate. I see my role largely in being able to take some of that complex science and translate it into language that people can understand and, more importantly, translate it into practical strategies that they can implement. And well, I would tell you, without question, uh, Christine, uh, you know, the language you use and the style with which you communicate, uh, both my wife, Dr. Michelle, and I have, have taken that and communicated it to all of our 8,000 patient base, and um, it's made it where they can understand it. So you've taken the complex, made it understandable. You didn't take the complexities out of it, but you made it understandable <laughs> to, to the layperson. And, and it's it's great. This is the way we should be communicating to our, our patient base. Well, I'd like to think so. And, and I also look at it like this, that um, as you mentioned too, Mother Nature knows what she's doing far more than, than we do. And I think what we try to do in modern medicine is we try to micromanage what's going on inside mm -hmm. human cells. We have absolutely no ability to micromanage the subtle moment-to-moment -moment, um, <laughs> feedback mechanisms. You know, you, you influence something and it has a spin-off elsewhere in all these complex pathways. I like to take the view, give Mother Nature her toolbox and then stand back, get out of the way and yep. let her do what she needs to do without micromanaging. And, you know, I see so many of these highly synthetic supplements appearing on the market and one's better than the, the last one and the next one and there's always some subtle reason you've got to buy this one over that one. Get out of the way. We don't know what we're doing. We haven't no. got a clue. Uh, and, look, I've seen this with NAC. NAC is, just takes the world by storm. It was developed as a means of, um, well, protecting people from death if they had acetaminophen or paracetamol poisoning, right. and it does a brilliant job in the acute care environment. Why do we then think if something's good in an acute care environment, it must be good for day-to-day -day use or it must be good for chronic care? We don't know that. Mm -hmm. We just assume that. And although there are some uh, impressive clinical trials using NAC in mental health issues, NAC is uh, a precursor to the molecule glutathione. Mm -hmm. Why would I want to give that when I know that if I switch on NRF2, I've switched on all the genes that govern the synthesis of glutathione in the cell when the cell wants it, not when I choose to dose mm -hmm. at 10 o'clock or 3 o'clock or, or whatever happens. So I, I think in many ways natural medicine uh, is moving too far into what I call pharmaconutrition. There's Good. a little division between pharmaceutical medicine and nutritional medicine, and I'm calling it pharmaconutrition. Mm -hmm where we're just trying to micromanage and we're meddling and we do not understand. So I like the more the you know, the you more you realise you don't know. Yeah. I like the way you put that because here we, we use a term uh, green pharmacy or polypharmacy, the same idea. And, and mm -hmm. truly the body, um, I think we agree that um, we need to get out of the sort of reactionary mode and get into the proactive mode and let it do what it's been doing for the existence of time. It mm -hmm. fights diseases. It, it, it kills bacteria when necessary. It, it eliminates virus um, activity in our lives. And it's able to defend us or we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Exactly. Exactly. Now, that's not to say that modern medicine doesn't have a place. So don't right. misunderstand me there. Yeah. Um, you know, we've all taken a prescription for whatever for some sort of a, an acute situation and thank goodness we've been able to do that. But it's just the total reliance on it that really distresses me. I mean, we mentioned cardiovascular disease before mm. and you said 600,000 yep. deaths a year in, in the US and 43,000 here. Statins are 
you know, they're, they're the prescription drug of choice. And when you really look at the data on that, you look at how the safety studies were done mm -hmm. and you look at the side effect profile and the fact that they're not really treating the upstream cause of the problem. If no, individuals had access to that information, not everybody would want to take it, mind you. Lots of people just want to pop a pill. But for those yeah. who really want to understand how can I fix my body, it got like this for some reason. We know cardiovascular disease has a huge dietary component. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can just unravel some of that to the point where we've optimised whatever we've got left, lots of people would take on that advice if only they knew where to get it. Christine, do you think that, and this is just a, a, a obviously a purely hypothetical, thought-provoking question, do you think that we as a world population, because we haven't addressed this upstream nutrigenomic process, do you think we're creating a population that's aging too quickly or aging too rapidly? We would have to, I would say, mm -hmm. um, be doing that. We would have to. To. If I just click forward onto this slide here, um, this is a, a Korean professor, Young Jun Su, who's we're fairly well known in this arena. Um, and he talks here about NRF2 as a master redox switch in turning on the signaling involved in the induction, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's other studies that go on past his talking about master redox switch who also talk about it as the master of the aging process. Because what you're really doing with NRF2, you are just ensuring that your cells are operating at that peak. Now, given that we don't have dietary deficiencies, that's a given. Mm -hmm. um, but you can do the best you can with your cells if you can activate NRF2. If it's mm -hmm. not functioning as it should, yeah, you're going to age um, faster because you're going to be generating a lot more inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. If you think back to the very first image I showed you where we had the healthy food switching on the protective genes and we had the donuts and whatever the junk was <laughs> down in the lower left of that slide, um, that's switching on the pro-inflammatory molecules. I mean, that's a very simplistic view of what's happening. But it, in truth, that's it. That is the message in a nutshell. That is nutrigenomics. Eat the junk, you turn on inflammation, don't eat it you're going to reduce inflammatory markets. Let me ask you this. You know, a lot of people, um, you know, say sometimes that, well, uh, Christine, Mark, I want to do this um, just with do eating food, just with eating food, no supplements. Um, is that possible? And what's your thoughts on that? Okay. Um, over the last... 30, 40 years or so, how long is that since 1960? No, it's more than that, 60 years. Um, the multivitamin movement really started to take hold. I'm getting to your question, don't be alarmed. Yeah, yeah. And um, that, when the multivitamin movement took hold, it came along with a clever little marketing tag that said something like, everyone knows there's nothing left in your food, here, take our pills, buy our pills, stay on our pills. That message has never left us. Now, there is elements of truth in that without a doubt. Um, but there has been, in fact, very little research to confirm that. And I've never really supported that view as an excuse to stop eating real food. I did for a long time in practice partially believe that story and knowing that patients don't eat what they should. But I always have had a food first philosophy. So you get yep. the food right as far as you can. Now, back to the soil story. Um, there was a study done in 2010, and I think it was in your nutrigenomics course, mm -hmm. um, a group headed up by Hermsdorf, and what they did is they wanted to find out how much plant food you would have to eat a day to significantly reduce your inflammatory markers. So they gave people... Uh, 300 grams of vegetables a day, 450 and 600 grams a day. Put them on a uh, test run for a month and these were just ordinary supermarket vegetables, just we're going to do the clinical trial, run down to the supermarket, get the vegetables, hand them around. No organic, no special permaculture soil, nothing. 
ordinary supermarket veggies. And what it showed was the uh, inflammation markers, as I recall, interleukin-6 and C-reactive protein, were significantly reduced by the group who are eating the 600 grams a day of vegetables. And that's where I get my 600 gram benchmark mm. from. There was another study done subsequent to that by another group with cardiovascular disease, and they found 800 grams would do the job. Now, the point I want to make there is, however the soil's been dam damaged over the years, whatever trace elements are not there, we can still use whatever food is available in order to be able to get significant reductions in inflammation markers. And I would think most definitely if more of those sorts of studies were done, we would continue to reaffirm that message. So mm -hmm. to me, that was a very powerful message and um, I, had a, I had a hard time convincing some of my Australian mm -hmm. clinicians about that and uh, and um they see the study and they're kind of persuaded and then i persuade them to actually do it in practice and they are staggered you can still do amazing things with food now that doesn't cure everybody's disease by any means uh, because sometimes there is damage that's been done this internal scarring and and so on um, and we do use well-chosen, nutrigenomically active supplements to speed things along. But that diet is the core of what I recommend doing. So, I love that. Um, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah, that's good. And, you know, I think that um, you know, a lot of our listeners that, um, you know, some of them have been through our clinic here where we are, there's a, there's a big empty uh vase out in the front of our lobby with pill bottles that are spilling over the top of it that are empty <laughs> and and they want to know how you did that and sometimes um i don't have the answer i just know that when you eat real food and get out the crap the garbage um good things happen and the mm -hmm. body begins to respond and all of a sudden now you have dysfunction and disease becoming functional and peace and i and and sometimes i don't even know the answers but i echo what you said and and affirm what you said it's right food first yes and since um you did that training course in nutrigenomics i'm i'm on a different bandwagon as well now um and it's the fact that we have a new food group or we should have and it's the probiotic fermented foods mm. So I teach a lot now about foods like kimchi and sauerkraut and kefir and, and those sorts of foods. Uh, they are very therapeutic. And we've begun to realise that probiotic supplements don't do a lot of what we thought they would do, but these fermented foods will and they're cheap and you make them at home. So there's no excuse for saying to, you know, the patient says, I can't afford $50 yeah. for a bottle of this for a month and then there's the other people in my family. So there are lots of ways of making this practical and so we help them to spend their money in the right place and, yes, they've got to spend more on veggies um, but they're spending probably a lot less on supplements because we talk about targeted supplements that work, not a whole list of things that are just tossed in there without understanding the mechanism. I mean, when I when I ask people who are huge proponents of vitamin C in the immune system, so how is that working in the immune system? Well, they give me glib answers, but they don't understand the mechanism, and that's because what vitamin C does in the, in the immune system is fairly narrow and it's not able to detect the infection it's not able to respond it's a bit player and it's an essential bit player to me it's like having a symphony orchestra and yeah. the two violins down the back yeah they need to be there uh, for the full effect but if they didn't show up today they're not the main players if the conductor didn't show up well you know we'd have an awful scramble so I just think it's a matter of trying to understand at a cellular level what do you think this supplement does when you prescribe it um, and you'll be scratching your head because this is what happened to me when I left mm. clinical practice and I thought, 
why did I prescribe that or this? What, what did I think that was doing? And I had to be honest and say, I don't know. That's what well, you- we did. That's, that's just what I was taught to do. I who, of, when, how, why, I don't know. But that's what we did. One of the, uh, when I was taking your course, there was a study there. You mentioned vitamin C. This one just stuck out and it's been ingrained in my brain ever since. It was a study on um, um, IV vitamin C. And it was talking about in that particular study, it actually became more pro carcinogenic. And I was like, what? You know, because I was always taught differently. And now here in the U.S., it is not uncommon to just from a prophylactic standpoint to see intravenous glutathione and vitamin C given just to anybody that wants it. And it and I can't seem to convince them to uh, perhaps think another way. Kind of talk about that a bit. Well, it's the same here. It, it happens here, too. That's. Mm. Um, it's used widely. Now, um, as um, an alternative to chemotherapy, the um, intravenous vitamin C is given, mm-hmm. and there is a good mechanism to explain why that happens. If you recall, most of the chemotherapeutic drugs have a pro- pro-oxidant effect. Yeah. So what you're doing with high-dose vitamin C intravenously, you are deliberately creating a pro-oxidant effect because you want to kill cancer cells. And in a sense, it's a safer version of um, the chemotherapy. But unfortunately, the science of oral and intravenous vitamin C gets conflated and it all gets mixed up together and people read these amazing things happen with intravenous C and they assume that they take a fistful of ascorbate pills and the same thing will happen. It doesn't. So... As for giving the intravenous um, glutathione, glutathione's got a pretty short Mm half-life anyway. Um, There's all sorts of controversies over glutathione. For many years, the publications would show that it would be degraded in the gut. I mean, it's just a tripeptide, a couple Mm. of three amino acids, gets broken down. Now, all of a sudden, we have glutathione for reasons which I don't understand and aren't disclosed, but now apparently does get into the bloodstream. So mm-hmm. I have a question mark still hanging over that. Giving it intravenously, of course, you bypass the gut and it will mm-hmm. go into the blood, but it isn't going to last very long. It can't. It's got a very short half-life. Yeah. But it's a substance you are making yourself all day, every day, when your body wants glutathione, it makes it on cue. It makes it in the right amount and it makes it when it wants it and it stops making it when it doesn't want it. So this is back to the modulation where nature knows when it needs something and when it doesn't need something. And us pumping glutathione and ascorbate into the bloodstream makes absolutely no sense to me if I'm going to stay with the principles of understanding upstream cell function. Mm -hmm. Sounds like what we know right now would be to use this weak pro-oxidant, this sulforaphane-yielding uh, product to weakly start the system and flip on that nerve 2 switch so that we can produce all of these defense mechanisms that, that protect us. And that seems like a basic thing, but it's something that is sort of clouded and shrouded with uh, confusion. And you've done an amazing job, as I always knew you do, um, about, you know, unwinding this and uh, sort of explaining it to us. Um, I would certainly love to... um, uh, do this again and, and even get into the immune side of this thing because there's a lot of stuff we discussed sort of pre-interview um, today that I think would be fascinating in this current climate in which we live. So, um, Christine, there's people out there right now that are saying, okay, okay, I got it. I got it. Uh, <laughs> what would you say to those people right now as a way of encouragement uh, just to, to get them going down a right path? I think step one is go and have a look in your pantry and have a look in your refrigerator and seriously take all the junk out and put it on the bench and decide what you're going to do with it. I won't won't tell you what to do with it. I know what I would do with it. 
But, but the other thing is, seriously, I I get people started on 600 grams of non-starchy vegetables a day. Yeah. And the way we do that is go and pull out of the fridge all of the vegetables you have there, put them on the bench, decide you know, what you would normally have in a meal and put them on the scales and weigh them and just see what you are eating mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then fill up that container and find out what 600 grams is and start getting programmed to that. Now, if you're normal body weight, you can add some starchy veg to that. If you're a bit overweight or a lot overweight, you just stick with the non-starchies. Mm -hmm. But by adding those 600 grams a day, things will start to improve in the right direction and we'll toss out some of the junk while we're at it. That in itself would make a huge difference. You want to go to the next level and you have some conditions which are inflammatory in nature. Most conditions are if they're chronic. You probably want to look at, at um, something like a, um, a whole broccoli sprout supplement like mm -hmm. our Enduracell mm -hmm. and um, just start taking that. If you've got lots of gut problems already, you might find you need to take it at a fairly low dose because it will identify weaknesses in um, the organisms living in the gut and you've got too many of the bad guys in there, it'll kill them off and you can get a bit of discomfort and bloating and diarrhoea in the short term. But we just slow the dose down and we gradually increase that over two weeks up to the normal dose and try it and see. That's all I can suggest. I can't be more specific than that because, as you know, every patient is different and yeah. probably need proper guidance. But start with the pantry and the fridge. That would be the very best place to start. Well, that is um, brilliant. Uh, wonderful, perfect advice, because as all of our listeners know right now, um, we, we have said that and it's so refreshing. Thank you for saying, saying that again, because I want people to hear it over and over again until it becomes uh, solid in their life as a truth that it is. So, uh, Christine, thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, for doing this and shedding some light on uh, everything. We'll make sure to put uh, a link to um, your bio and um, we'll put a link to uh, the Enduracell down here because I, I, I highly recommend we do it to literally every person that sits in our offices every mm -hmm. day. And I, and I don't see a reason why we wouldn't. I mean, it's like, OK, that makes sense. So. Um, Really appreciate you and uh, hope you have a, a wonderful day. And uh, man, we've got to do this again. This 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 is like a conversation that like goes fast. It's, I love that. It's good. Well, it's been a lot of fun for me too, Mark. I enjoy talking about this, obviously. And I had all these other slides sitting here that we didn't even go anywhere near. And that's fine. That'll be an excuse for another day. So it's been fun and I've enjoyed it very much and my regards to your wife, Michelle, as well. Yeah. And hope to chat again. Well, we will. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to another edition of Healthcare's Missing Link, a podcast where we help you uncover those things that are stealing your best health. And don't let those things that are uncovered stay or covered up, stay uncovered, because we need to make sure we put the right things in so that these wonderful, magnificent creations called the human body can do what they're supposed to do. If one thing I ask you to do every time is subscribe to find out who is next, what's coming next, what the subject matter is, and, and stay tuned because there's more guests like uh, Christine Houghton. She's coming back. We'll do this again, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time on Healthcare's Missing Link.